Hey everybody, thanks so much for uh, joining us today. Um, I'm joined with Todd McLeese on, on the line here on our conference call or our webinar. And uh, we're gonna be talking about planning for emergence for the COVID-19 uh, recession. Um, a couple of things out of the gate that I wanted to just touch on. Uh, oddly enough, Todd and I had a podcast back on March 13th. Uh, we had spoken on that Friday about, hey, we should probably talk about what's going on. And uh, we were going to meet in the office that that next Monday, and uh, we didn't. We ended up doing a podcast over, um, you know, a conference bridge, and we talked a lot about how businesses are going to, you know, uh, connect, how leadership is going to monitor the workforce, and how people are going to try to stay connected um, through human connectivity and find purpose to their work and and stay in tune with their company culture. And now, fast forward, we're heading into June. It's Memorial Day weekend, and we're finally starting to come out of this. So. I'm really excited to hear what Todd has to say about um, what that experience has been like and kind of what the horizon looks like as we continue to march forward here. Um, and before we get into that, just uh, you know, two bits on uh, Swick Tech as a company. For those that don't know, uh, my name is Eric Clark. I'm one of our client success associates. I've been with Swick Tech for uh, about three years. Uh, the company Swick Tech has been around for 15 years as of last year. We celebrate our, celebrated our 15th year in business. We have um, <clears throat> right around 30 employees uh, in totality and um, by and large, we're a technology consultant, a managed service provider. We do have a local help desk um, to you know, be IT as a service for some organizations, but we also do a lot of just proactive monitoring and maintenance of patching and, and things of that nature uh, with a big, huge emphasis, especially now with COVID going on cybersecurity. So we have a really strong uh, and intelligent, experienced team around that. Uh, some housekeeping items before we hand it over to Todd. Uh, this is a webinar that's live. Um, hopefully there's no technical difficulties. We've been pretty successful with these things over the last two to three months. Um, I apologize in advance for any crying babies, toddlers, meowing cats, barking dogs, and uh, we hope everybody gets some value out of today's uh, presentation. So thank you, Todd, for, for being here with us today. Happy to do it, Eric. Thanks. Over to me then. <laughs> yep. All right. And uh, just just so it doesn't go without saying, I will be doing some of the moderating here. So if questions come through, Todd, if I feel like I can interrupt you, I will uh, to ask any questions that come through so we can be a little bit more fluid and dynamic with the presentation. Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for taking the time today. Um, I'm, I'm going to run through uh, some of the research that I've been working on with uh, a group of collaborators um, as it relates to emerging from crisis and thriving in the next normal. I'm also going to talk today a little bit about uh, the future of work and the opportunities in front of us um, as we see them. And we're going to talk about um, some of the ecosystems that have been forming in the region, things that you can get involved in that can help as you uh, emerge from crisis. So th this is a three horizons framework. It's a McKinsey framework um, and I've applied it to the COVID-19 crisis. Essentially, um, this is typically an innovation framework, but today what we're how we're thinking about this is uh, Horizon One was, is and was the rapid response. It's more about defending li uh, lives and livelihoods. It's uh, creating resilience within the business and building community. Second Horizon is, is the recovery. This is where we emerge stronger. This is the time we're just entering now. And the third Horizon is thriving in the next normal. And when you think about the picture in front of you right now, the thing to notice is that these horizons overlap. There's no bold line between these horizons. That it varies by industry and so forth. So um, let's jump into some of the content. When we think about the three R's uh, to emerge and thrive, what we think about is return, reimagine, and reform. So first of all, um, creating detailed plans. And I'm going to take you through an exercise in just a moment around scenario planning that I learned in a book called Seeing Around Corners, which was written by Rita McGrath. Um, the next piece is reimagine. So in the next normal, how do if the shifts are discontinuous, for instance, if we see a, um, a spurt of 
uh, an outbreak that occurs in the fall, what happens? We have to plan for these things. So we have to plan for them from every perspective that we can think of as it relates to our business. One of the ways to um, begin to respond more strategically rather than reactively to the crisis is to form planning teams. So this is a prescription that you can find in every large um, analyst firm that's talking to, this is a McKinsey model, but uh, Deloitte talks about this, Accenture talks about this and so forth. We know our work groups, we've, we've formed our response teams, we've got our business continuity team. If we're a small company, maybe our, um, our teams are made up of largely the same people, but we have to look for ways to incorporate uh, other members of our team to get that diversity of, of thought in the room. So we've been working on business continuity, financial resiliency, supply chain, putting out fires essentially, seeing who's still up and running, who's in the game, who can help us, who can't, filling holes, filling gaps and so forth. We've been doing that now for a, a solid couple of months. Now the question becomes, how do we form teams that can be out in front of what's coming next? How do we form planning teams? The planning teams that can work on our near-term, mid-term, and long-term talent strategy, the planning teams that can work on the group, um, remaining engaged with the group that's still working from home, the group that is going to redevelop the supply chain as some companies are now unable to supply what we need, and the group that's going to work on customer retention. Previously, we, we have groups working on engagement with customers, making sure that they know that we're still here for them, making sure they know we can still supply them. Now it's a matter of with all of the change going on around us, how do we keep the customers in the fold and um, how do we support them as they go through their cycles, their planning and with their customers and so forth. And then we need planning teams or at least if it, again, if you have a six person leadership team and those are the only people at the table, that's your decision. First suggestion I would say is to widen that group inside and outside the company. Many companies and leaders, and peers, colleagues, they're going through this same thing for the first time. We can reduce the number of mistakes by widening the group and getting more and more perspectives within reason. Now, we have to be thinking right now about what upskilling and reskilling has to take place in our company, meaning that uh, we have furloughed a percentage of our team. We've we've reduced staff We've uh, permanently. We are now looking at acquiring new talent, but the team that we have in place, do they have the skills to thrive in the next normal? After every significant financial crisis, what we typically have seen is um, investment in automation technology. And when we think about digital transformation, we know that it's about people, tra it's a people transformation first and foremost, it's a skills transformation. So can we have people in the organization right now looking at what our opportunities are in terms of the talent, making sure it's ready for what we need in the middle term, not tomorrow, but 90 days from now, 180 days from now, there are upskilling and reskilling opportunities that are available right now. Uh, business model innovation and customer acquisition on the people side, we'll come back to that. You know, as working groups and planning teams work together, a network effect naturally occurs. So this is, um, this is the theory of small groups. When these groups, planning, work groups, uh, thrive teams for uh, the next normal, the emerge phase, as they communicate with one another, and again, there'll be some same in a small company, there'll be people on the same team uh, on different teams here. Um, more gets done. There's again, more sharing, more learning. What we're looking for right now is to find ways to learn in a scalable way. And then as priorities shift and you begin to emerge, let's, let's say 30 days from now, 60 days from now, this is something you should keep your eye on. You can form new teams. You can base those teams on the effectiveness of the players, Maybe you need to infuse a team with good leadership or somebody who can just get things done and instill the, the sorts of progress that you need in the organization. These teams should be adaptable. The strength, and you can also form the teams based on relationships that are in their nascent stage that um, you didn't know existed before, and maybe they didn't exist, but these new working relationships can be stronger than we think. Now I want to turn to scenario planning. I'm going to spend a little bit of time on this tool. This is a tool right out of Rita McGrath's book, Seen Around Corners. 
And this is around finding whatever perspectives are relevant to you, but multiple perspectives, not just financial resiliency and employee safety, but building a detailed relaunch map and then leveraging a few different horizons of thought or perspective. What we know right now, what today's assumptions are about all of these different lenses, these different stakeholders, if you will, what might happen? What are the potential shifts that you see coming down the road? You don't have to be right. You just have to have multiple choices right now. So if you're looking three or six months down the road for your business, when you think about potential shifts, you can be planning for multiple scenarios so you can be less reactive when that time comes. You don't have to guess right today about what will happen 90 days from now or what happens in your business, your organization, if there's an outbreak that happens in either in Wisconsin or in a market that impacts your customers that you rely on for revenue. Uh, and then let's be thinking too, I was on, the, on a call the other day with a group of employers um, in the context of higher education. And we were talking about resiliency within the organization, emotional intelligence, open communication, um, the ability for people to look forward was how one business owner put it. How do we keep people focused on what the future is instead of the crisis? Uh, because we spend so much time looking at the, the coronavirus total boards and so forth. So how do we get people focused on the future? And the reality is there is a team or multiple teams based on the stakeholders you see on the left that can be focused on future possibilities. How do we reinvent the business? We've all read the stories about how certain companies have pivoted, about how certain companies have diversified revenues during the crisis. Some of those will maintain that business. Others will um, go back to normal operations or try to. What are the possibilities for your organization now? So let's talk about the restart. This is the process we're all going through. We're seeing people coming back to the office, uh, various plans in place in terms of sh uh, shift changes and uh, distribution of workforce, two thirds, one third sharing of uh, people working from home and so forth. I want to lay out for you eight elements of strategy as it comes to the restart. The first is creating that detailed launch, relaunch map. Now, you saw an example of that on the previous slide, and we'll make that tool available to the team at SWIC Tech so they can share that with you um, in a usable format rather than one on a, on a slide. Um, but, you know, the crisis has shattered many of the assumptions and the tools that business leaders rely on for decision making. During the restart, we'll need to redefine and establish a solid framework for action in a highly volatile environment. The best approach is to develop that detailed launch plan. Remember on the previous slide when we were looking at the uh, scenario planning, multiple scenarios, not one. Don't try to be right, but plan for customers to go away. Plan for customers to be unable to pay. But what happens, how will you act differently if customers pay on time? And to what percentages? You need to set thresholds. The map will guide production, supply chain, marketing, and sales efforts. It'll help determine a recovery timeline for each site. It will also enable you, the business leaders, your teams to get a head start on reassessing the investments and the prospects for changing the geography of the value that you deliver. The value chains, for example, through reallocation of assets. Um, we know that there are assets that won't be able to be fully utilized right now because of um, particular market segments or products and services that are no longer as relevant to customers. It's not something that customers can uh, prioritize. The second piece is providing customers with safety guarantees that restore their trust. So emerging from lockdown, uh, clients will be more vigilant about health and increase their demands about safety as they interact with you. So companies will need to provide products and services that adhere to the most rigorous health and safety conditions. Uh, you've got to define those conditions for a safe experience. One of the things that I'm seeing is there 
there's no standards. So everybody's trying to make great decisions on their own. I'll come to a solution after we get through these eight points for one of those things as it relates to PPE. But we need to know that uh, customers need to know that they feel safe. And this isn't restricted to, you know, movie theaters, gyms and restaurants. This is about uh, coming on site or your people coming on site. We had uh, a service person come over the other day. There was no mask. There was nothing. We didn't have one to offer him. Um, it needed the work needed to get done, but just in terms of people in the field, people going on site to perform necessary maintenance, etc. Uh, customers need to know that you get it, that you um, whether or not you believe in the uh, the virality, uh, the levels of virality, and the safety conditions, and so forth. You don't know how your customers feel about it necessarily, and you need to be out in front. The same goes for employees. Many employees are eager to return to work but they're also worried about being able to do that safely. So companies need to both reassure employees about safety and find ways to motivate them in uh, post lockdown. So when they come back, there are a few things you can do. You, you can ensure employee safety in the workplace. I think many companies are out right now looking for PPE, setting up their HR policies around um, the office environment with masks and hand sanitizer and uh, disinfectant wipes and so forth, cleaning crews with uh, new capabilities as it relates to sterilization and so forth. Uh, you can extend protection measures to employees outside the office. It's been done by multinational, very large companies in Asia and China, for instance. Some companies will um, encourage individual travel for commuting to and from work or provide employees with safety equipment for personal use. Uh, I know one company in the region that just sent a care package of 50 procedural masks, hand sanitizers, a card that had um, a list of their core values, and a thank you note from their CEO. And from what the leadership team shared with me, that care package of 50 masks, let's call that, if you purchase that well, it's probably a, uh, they also sent um, infrared thermometers, handheld thermometers for everybody. So they probably spent $120, $130 per um, employee. Significant investment, no question. But they said that the reaction that they got was actually more grateful than when they sent out a surprise cash bonus a couple of years ago because they know that they have not only their health, but their family's health in mind. Um, and then when it comes to remobilizing employees beyond their safety concerns, they're going to raise questions about the extent to which the new ways that we've learned during the lockdown can be leveraged. Um, and so it's possible that the experience will generate concerns and that there may be even be family pressure to delay coming back to work. And so you really have to think through as a leadership team how you're going to handle situations like that. The next piece is a big one. And, you know, that first slide, I didn't spend much time on it. Uh, and I'm not going to go back to it visually, but I, I do want to say that there's a there's a phrase not just in the region, but around the world right now that it's not a switch, it's a dial. And the reality is it's it's not a dial. It's a it's a mixing board. It's a studio mixing board. And I don't, I'm dating myself and I don't know about you, but I remember the days of, uh, you know, the five lever um, equalizers. And I didn't know how to properly set the audio leveraging one of those. When you get into a big studio and there's a massive mixing board in front of you, which dial you turn first uh, is going to be different. There are, will be difficult decisions to make here. And this has to do with both internal and external pressures. One imperative for your business is to revive their cust your customer base. Um, you'll have to stimulate demand. You can't guarantee that there is going to be the sort of demand uh, coming back in any near term period, you have to stay engaged. You have to guard against any risk of distorting price models right now. We're seeing some of that with PPE. We're seeing some of that as companies spin back up, try, especially those companies that are considered um, more uh, significantly in need right now, where there's a little bit of supply and demand at play. Really have to think about the midterm and long term health of the customer relationships. You should adopt tactical pricing, it has, should be adaptive. Um, help core clients with solving their issues. 
So there's a in supply chain, for instance, which we're going to talk about next. There's you know the large, uh, very mature companies with strong supply chain operations. They actually invest in helping their suppliers, especially the strategic ones, solve their issues. Today, it may be necessary, especially if you have revenue concentration concerns, for you to get as engaged as you can with your customers and to help them understand what their path is, engage with them, become part of that peer, add value now in ways that you've never added value before, become part of that peer network for them, people that they know that they can count on. You also need to optimize your marketing mix right now. Now, marketing, a lot of marketing budgets are shut down or, or delayed or um, heavily cut at a minimum, but you've got to ensure that the offering that, you've, that you are leading with and your go-to-market message is in line with the crisis-related shift in demand. Uh, operations and supply chain, I'm just very quickly on this piece, the optimal restart of operations, it requires that you return to market at the desired speed to serve the demand that is accumulated during lockdown. So how are you coming back? At what pace? These are the types of things that you need to uh, discern in talking in engaging with your suppliers to understand uh, whether or not you need to add depth to your supply base right now in order to satisfy any pent up need in order to take advantage of frankly any um, tactical opportunity that you've got to generate some revenue and some cash flow so there's a, there's a delicate balance here to be struck um, but you should be thinking about a phased recovery and if you go back to scenario planning, we're not talking about one plan. This is a little different point than I made before, but you don't have to be right. There's also multiple plans based on what you learn from the various perspectives. As you engage with your customers and your suppliers, who's ready right now? You need to be more entrepreneurial and more innovative than you've ever been in recent years. If you're running a mature company right now, you really need to be thinking about how to exercise the muscle, not in the name necessarily of a full on pivot, but rather who you can be engaging and what problems you can be solving. Because the truth about this matter is none of us have been through this before. And if you can become that resource for your customers or your suppliers, the strength of your relationships as we get into the next normal is going to be incredible. Uh, I should probably le leave IT and technology to the guys at Swick Tech. Um, the, they're the experts, but I will say this, from the start of the lockdown, um, let's call it 60 days ago, CIOs, CTOs, IT teams, I mean, nobody has had bigger demands on them in terms of remote work, um, the need to orchestrate uh, employee skills, com immediately upskill people to be able to work virtually, help leaders uh, find ways to engage with those employees using technology. It's been pretty incredible. It's also broken down some barriers across industries, whether that's education um, in every industry, small businesses, large businesses across the diverse group. In professional services, they've gone from 5% remote work to over 90% remote work. Um, of course, the world has changed as it relates to uh, work from home and, and work remotely. And what I've seen in engaging with small, medium and large companies over the last two to four weeks is that um, my opinion on it is, is that the this is anecdotal. The larger the company, the more sophisticated the company, the more conservative they're being as they come back to work. Um, maybe they're in a little better situation from their balance sheet and cash flow perspective, maybe, or cash reserves perspective. Maybe um, they have greater liability as it relates to, you know, a, a workforce that measures into the thousands. But I would say that the um, every anecdote that I've heard is that the large companies are being more conservative about when they're coming back to work. One of the things that I'm also hearing, and I actually challenged a couple of people during a live stream the other day, because oftentimes when we hear, um, you know, automation will increase significantly now and digital transformation will finally move and so forth. Sometimes that narrative can be driven by the technology companies and the, and the consulting companies. Um, but strategically, there's a need to accelerate 
what you can do digitally to serve your customers, your new customers, your incumbent customers, as well as your employee needs. And so, you know, we've learned a lot about the infrastructures that we have in place uh, over the last 60 days. We know there are investments that need to be made. Of course, they have to be made carefully, um, but we need to do the things that are necessary to allow for virtual work uh, on a dime, right? If we have to, if we have to call an audible. We also have to find ways to be more data driven about the decision making, which, you know, when you if you've been involved in data analytics conversations over the last couple of years, wondering whether or not you should pull the trigger on um, some of those investments. Clearly right now, given the finite nature of the resources that we have, the time that we have, the people that we have, we have to make better use of all of those resources. And the best way to do that is being data driven. Um, when we think about steering uh, the restart or leading the restart with care, we've got to think about speed of decision making. We've got to think about initiating subsequent phases of the actual recovery and have those plan ahead teams that we talked about in place. And then lastly, sustaining value creation. So we've all heard the stories. Uh, um, many companies with the ability to continue, those that were seen as essential over the last 60 days, they've at least partially during this confinement period had to find ways to radically adopt um, a new operating model within just a few days. And I, I'll go back to, it's not a commercial, well, we don't necessarily think of it as a commercial entity, but just think about the 150,000 college students that are in the M7 region and it's served by 18 institutions of higher education, the colleges and universities. Think about the wide spectrum of results in the K through 12 space in terms of the ability to turn on uh, distance learning and or digital learning and a, um, a curriculum that had uh, that was you know, still robust for the students. Um, the same thing is going on in terms of a spectrum of outcomes in B2C and B2B businesses. Um, companies um, have to make decisions now about the strengths that they have found in their organization, um, whether or not that those are sustainable. So in many situations, the crisis has been an opportunity for them to strengthen relationships with their large and strategic customers or solidify their supplier ecosystem. But now having navigated through what is likely the hardest part, as long as we can get in front of the next uh, potential outbreak, as long as we do scenario planning, we have to think about how we can incorporate that into our future thinking and think about how we reinvent or reimagine our existing business models. Um, so I'll, I'll stop there for a moment. I, I just want to, I want to share this with you. There is a, uh, what I think of, so I've, I spent a couple of weeks uh, volunteering, a little longer than that, volunteering for a um, supply chain team in the senior living industry. And uh, the goal was to build a robust supply chain in parallel to the healthcare industry. And what I learned during that time about procuring products from China, like masks, uh, N95, KN95, procedural masks and so forth uh, was incredible. Fit more than 15,000 mask factories have be, have started operating in China in the last 90 days. Um, Ryan, you can bring me up on the screen if you want. And um, only uh, less than 100 of them can actually export those products and they're demanding cash up front. So many companies taking the risk of trying to procure directly from Asia or from China right now are uh, running into quality issues and running into um, import export or even fraud issues. Um, at the same time, it's kind of the wild west in terms of what I'm seeing in the marketplaces that have been spun up in the region or on various vendor websites. So what I've decided to do with about 15 others is spin up a PPE buying group and we'll get information to you after this. If you would like to participate in um, a group that follows best practices has a M7, so the seven counties um, 
all these vetted manufacturers are producing things from procedural masks. Uh, Foxconn is making 300,000 masks a day in Racine right now, procedural masks, uh, the blue masks. Um, we have access to those. We have uh, an agreement in place with Central Standard for their hand sanitizer. We we so we have those consumables uh, coming into this buying group. We also have access to higher end products like high throughput infrared cameras, and we just want to minimize the mistakes, um, maximize the efficiency of the spend right now because you know masks that can be purchased for ninety eight cents are going for. A uh, dollar fifty to two dollars and fifty cents right now, and when you are burning through those at fifty a day or a hundred a day, that's going to add up very quickly, and that's the very low end of the spend. But whether it's plastic partitions and so forth, we've been curating a group of qualified suppliers to serve a group that can um, economize, build efficiencies in, into the decision making process because we don't all have to go out and do our own homework and we can just procure in a more um, efficient way. I'm going to pivot there and move on to the future of work and just talk about some of the things that have been uh, some of the research I've been doing over the last couple of months and um, what how I see the crisis impacting. We were already living in a significant time of disruption. Uh, how I used to make my living was flying around the country talking about that. Um, as it relates to the uh, future of work. This is an old statistic. It's probably only directionally correct. But when you think about all of the tasks, everything that you do, that I do, that everybody on your team does throughout the day, um, the, the thought is, is that almost half of those tasks could be automated by 2033. Accenture did a study and came out and said, of all the occupations in the world right now, the jobs that exist today, and we know that in, you know, in the next 20 years, another, well, let me say it this way. In the last 20 years, since 1999, 21 years now, 65% uh, of the jobs that, that exist today um, have been born in the last 20 years. And that expectation is that will continue, right? I mean, we didn't have data scientists 20 years ago. We didn't have, um, webmasters 20 years ago, maybe just 20 years ago we did, but um, there have been so many cybersecurity roles, et cetera, that have spun up in the last 20 years. So just imagine what's coming in terms of new jobs, but in the jobs that exist today, um, Accenture breaks it down three ways, that which is uniquely human, that which can be augmented, and that which can be automated. And when you look at it in aggregate, roughly half of the tasks that we perform today can be augmented or automated. But when you look at the top 10 categories, and there's some big categories on the left side of your screen, those categories are highly automated or augmentable using technology that is already available today. Nothing else needs to be invented. This is really just a matter of market adoption now. And so here, what you see is that nine of the 10, more than 80% of the jobs, all the way up to 97% of the job can be automated or augmented. And the expectation is that will be accelerated. So what does that mean? Well, it means that there's an entire paradigm shift that we really all need to be comfortable with. And the way I think about that is there are four things that I consider to be true about the future of work. The future of work is first and foremost about continuous and lifelong learning. What this model indicates is what we all grew up with, what we all know today is life expectancy is about 73 years. You work until you're you know, 60 if you did really well in life and 70 if you, or, or beyond if you're interested in continuing to work or you have to, and then you retire and on average you die within one to five years. That's how the model was built. And it's front end loaded with education and your value kind of maxes out midway through your career. And then ultimately you put flaps down and you kind of glide into that retirement phase. This is what we know. Um, this is the model that many people are thinking about when we talk about reskilling and upskilling, and it's not correct. This is um, the great reskilling, right? This is okay, everybody. Pick up some new skills over the next year or two. Get ready for the digital economy. Be ready for the digital transformations. Get ready for etc. And 
this is not right. What it really is about is this. It's about continuous and lifelong learning. It's about job changes and career changes and industry changes. They say that the average Gen Z individual entering the workforce today, as we move towards healthy life extension of upwards of 90 years in the next 10 years, um, I suppose COVID aside, uh, the, um, the, the average person entering the workforce, 17 jobs in five different industries during their career, but consistently constant um, or continuous rather improvement and lifelong learning. That, that's the model and that's the first truth about the future of work. We have to get comfortable about continuous and lifelong learning and that means our existing team as well. This is how that looks. We, in order to be comfortable with lifelong learning, we also have to be comfortable with shedding the tasks that we currently assign our value to. And this is a model from Heather McGowan, who just released the Adaptation Advantage in April. She's a thought leader um, as it relates to how this is going to work. But what's important is that we have the not only ability, but the willingness to drop some skills that can be automated or can be atomized, which is outsourcing. Uh, I can break up this little piece of the job and outsource that and leverage the person that works on my team to deliver greater value. As I pick up new skills and figure out ways in which technology can augment me, I can move into a next role. And as that progresses, it, it's this cycle. And so this is the continuous and lifelong learning as I move through my career. And the concept is called tours of duty um, to expand human potential. And that's the second truth about the future of work is that we will find ways to tap into human potential. There's an acute need right now in the marketplace. Before COVID, World Economic Forum in 2018 talked about 54% upskilling, reskilling, and new skilling. Just quick definition check, upskilling is um, the things that you need to learn in order to stay in your role that is evolving. Reskilling is displacement from your current role. New skilling is learning things that we've never been taught before, or sorry, that we have never taught before. Nobody has ever taught this, how to interact with intelligent technologies, for instance. We'll talk about that in a moment. If done by yourself, if your business takes that on by yourself, assuming that you believe that your team needs to be reskilled, and the data that I've got from the region, which is more than 300 companies, says that the average business leader believes that 50 to 75 percent of their team needs reskilling in the next two to three years in order for them to continue to grow at the pace they're expecting to grow or wanting to grow. If they take that on by themselves, the average cost to reskill an employee is upwards of $25,000. The research says if there's a regional effort, a coordinated effort, the opportunity is to reduce that cost by 60 to 80%. This $10,000 figure represents 60%. The actual statistic is five to $10,000. So if we do the math quickly on a 200 person organization, what we're talking about is a two and a half million dollar spend. If you reskill half your team over a three year period of time, that which can't be found in any budget even prior to the financial crisis that we're now entering, um, or a million dollars. And so the savings is huge. And there is a coordinated regional effort to talk about. The opportunity is to move from the I skills, the highly disciplined skills. This is the skills of the 80s and the 90s. In, around in the 1990s, we started talking about T skills. That's still very popular today, multidisciplinary skills. And now what we're where we're going is transdisciplinary. So this is where the disciplines are converging. We have to be generalists. We have to be good at a lot of different things because roles are evolving and they are combining. They are converging. But in addition to that, we have to be ready to work with machines in some respects. And I'm not just talking about cobots on the shop floor. I'm not just talking about robotics. I'm also talking about RPA, robotic process automation, which is actually much further along as it relates to uh, market adoption, talking about leveraging intelligent technologies for customer service, for uh, accounting, for uh, legal work, and, and so forth. 
in the end, what happens, what is happening in the market as we look at higher education, there are 20 million undergraduates in the United States, and that number is going down. If you go back to the last uh, significant crisis we all went through in 2008, 2009, and you add 18 years to 2008, what you'll find is that in the midst of a financial crisis, not many children are born. And so the number of students entering college age, just demographically, is going to go down by as much as 20% between now and 2026. Where there is a significant market opportunity is the 120 million workers globally that needed reskilling. Now, now this was this slide and this, this model is from a time where while we still had underemployment and uh, workforce participation concerns, um, we only had 3% unemployment rate on some scales. And so this was a relative time of abundance. Um, and now we're talking about, I believe today, we're up to 38.4 million. And Secretary Mnuchin is talking about up to 50 million unemployed workers. That would be a, a, the same unemployment rate, 24.9%. He's talking about 25. 24.9 is where unemployment peaked during the Great Depression. It peaked in 1933. It took four years to get there. Here we're talking about months, not years. But the number of people in the workforce at the time, uh, the unemployed was 12 and a half million. If we get to that same level, that same percentage this time, we're talking about 50 million unemployed. So they will need new skills. When we look at technical skills, I did a survey of 317 respondents in this region, uh, the seven county region uh, in February of this year, just prior to the crisis. These were the usual suspects, the technical skills that people were looking for. Just as interestingly, maybe more interestingly, um, I've been on the phone with a lot of business leaders the last few days because I'm forming the industry forum for the higher eds right now in the region. Um, the conduit, if you will, to the uh, voice of industry or, um, you know, every school, uh, every two year and four year school has employer advisory boards. Uh, Higher Education Regional Alliance is a collaboration of all 18 schools and joining the industry forum is an opportunity to have a strategic voice with all 18. What I'm hearing in those phone calls is the need for training in leadership, empathy and compassion, emotional intelligence, resilience throughout the team, et cetera, um, in every industry. And this data uh, actually ties out to that. So what we're talking about in one part of the Higher Education Regional Alliance is having 18 schools combine efforts to build credentials, micro-credentials that can be earned in the areas of need to create more complete uh, employees because we go, you know, we are, products of two-year and four-year degrees, and the continuous and lifelong learning for us looks like these skills. Um, so four things, continuous and lifelong learning, unlocking human potential, the skills that are necessary to increase uh, the impact of human-to-human -human collaboration, and then the skills we need to be more data-driven, more evidence-based in our decision-making, and uh, the opportunity to work alongside the machines to augment the work that we do with purpose, ethics, values, and principles at the center. So what we're creating is an advanced learning ecosystem. So I want you to just think about PPE, safety of your workers. We're creating an ecosystem, an ecosystem of suppliers, an ecosystem of advisors, an ecosystem of customers. In advanced learning, we have an ecosystem that's forming of the community groups representing underserved populations. The economic development community is represented higher education, all 18 schools in the region are a part of this collaborative effort. And now we're bringing in the employers in the, through the industry forum. We're also beginning to work with secondary education, the ed tech companies, workforce development, certainly a significant part of it already. There's four ways you can, you can engage with the higher eds right now. You can become part of the uh, COVID response team for higher education, providing the voice of employers. You can be part of Goal Group 1, which is focused on college completion and closing the or narrowing the equity gap. Goal Group 2, which I talked about before, which is innovative programming to spin up um, certificates, badges, and credentials that can help quickly upskill and reskill uh, groups of employees for what is most needed. And then the third piece is, is um, 
pathways and bridges to talent. And, you know, typically that's um, accelerated time to degree. That is um, internships and apprenticeships. And one of the harsh realities of COVID has been most internships have been canceled for this summer. So I want to make sure you're aware of this program from the Commons in the region. The Commons is also a collaboration. All of the higher eds are a part of it. They have many, many corporate partners. They have spun up a virtual internship program, something that you should be looking at if you've had to cancel your internships this summer. Um, it's a 10 week program. Uh, uh, the first four weeks are focused on innovation. The last six weeks can be focused on challenges by industry. They've had more than 500 applicants in less than a week from more than 40 colleges and universities around the country. So the rule is you have to have Wisconsin roots. You either are, go to a Wisconsin based school, i.e. we want to keep you in the region, or you graduated from a Wisconsin based high school. And what we're finding are there are, um, I haven't seen this data, but what I'm hearing from Michael and Joe over at the Commons is that there are uh, applicants from Harvard and Stanford and Carnegie Mellon, but they have Wisconsin roots. There will be about 200 spots that they end up um, granting to these uh, of the 500 applicants. It's a high quality pool of applicants. It's an opportunity to both retain talent in the region as well as bring talent back in the region who are looking at internships outside. One of the other things I'm doing Todd, in, in terms of this. Go ahead, Eric. Totally derail you. I'm sorry. I, I do have a, a no, question. Right. Came in. Two, two came in, but one's more relevant for right now. We'll save the other for Q&A. But uh, someone had just asked, with the emphasis on reskilling, how does our company align reskilling to support the strategies to meet future of our markets and how to redeploy resources <laughs> in defining reskilling? Yeah, so um, the answer lies in scenario planning. So once you understand what markets you'll be addressing, uh, what impact that will have on your existing customer base, your ability to grow, um, what impact that will have on your suppliers and so forth, it will become clear. And you have to weigh um, the impact of technology, what jobs can be easily, what tasks, not whole jobs. Don't think about whole jobs, but rather the, the picture on the lower left right now is Rob and Jesse Thassen. We just did a live stream this week. The book Reinventing Jobs, and he's written many articles in HBR as well, about how to break the job down to understand what aspect of it can be automated. That has to be part of what you're thinking about too. What can I replace with technology, which frees up capacity of the people on our team uh, to leverage elsewhere? And the way that I would leverage those resources is based on my scenario planning uh, that I'm going through to have a robust plan regardless of what happens. Again, don't try to be right. Try to have lots of choices. If this happens, here's what we're going to do. If D happens, this is what we're going to do. If it happens with this timing and it knocks out this customer, which is 37% of our revenue, here's what we're going to do. This is the time to be doing that work right now. So I am um, hosting live streams. My goal as of a few weeks ago was to reach out to the global thought leaders. These people would be on Mount Rushmore. Um, you know, they, they're the people that speak at the World Economic Forum in Davos. Robin does that every year. Heather McGowan, I've talked about already. I've cited some of her work today. That's a wonderful book about where we're headed. It outlines, it, it explains some of the things I'm outlining. And then Rita McGrath is from uh, Columbia University and she's a, the, one of the best innovators in the world. And she talks about seeing around corners and inflection points. And we're living through the most aggressive and largest uh, inflection point we've ever lived through in our lives. Next week, I'm hosting a uh, workshop, which is intended for small teams. And if you're interested, it's free. It features Greg Sattel, who's one of the top innovation authors. Um, we're limiting this to just 100 people, and that's not because of the Zoom license. It's because we need to be able to facilitate these groups. Um, and so this is about how to take the ideas that you have right now and actually manage the change, because every transformation you go through in your organization is really a human transformation. 
We all know that only one out of four digital transformations succeed. We know how hard it is to make change happen. And much of that has to do with the fact that we are leveraging change principles, techniques, and tools that were born in the 70s and 80s when companies were very different. If, if you would like to learn next week about, um, and your team learn next week about what today's methods are for implementing change and creating momentum behind them to get your ideas across, then sign up for this. The, um, there's a, a popular opinion right now that the appetite for change is higher than ever, and that is true. I would just caution you to say that um, that doesn't necessarily mean they want to implement your change. Um, I talked about Hera, but it's these 18 um, schools, and, uh, and uh, Eric, I think I am through my content. So um, let me stop sharing my screen and come back to say hello and answer any questions that, that come up. Uh, yeah, I'll ask one of the questions that had come through before we get to our final slides here. Um, someone had asked, in regards to supply lines, has there been any discussion about potential food shortages and what kind of solutions can we put forward there? Hmm. Uh, there's lots of discussion. I'm, I can't say I'm directly involved in food supply. My only, I'm a couple of levels removed from it. I, we are, um, I started a, uh, along with, again, 15 other people, um, a collaborative called Converge MKE. And we started out with care packages just as a little pilot. Now we've got three initiatives going on. Um, one is around health equity, and that has to do with food scarcity. Um, food scarcity for those that can't afford food. And um, the health equity piece is the uh, disproportionate number of people in the region. Um, the mortality rate in the African-American and Latinx communities is significantly higher than the white community. And um, we are picking five hot zones and um, uh, by zip code and supplying food in much the same way that the Tandem has in Milwaukee um, to help restaurants pivot as well. Food, the food supply chain is completely broken right now. There's no question about that, but I don't have any insight into um, how to solve that issue. You don't have all of the answers for everything? <laughs> <laughs> um. Uh, Ryan, I know you're moderating in the background. I wanted to just share a screen here real quick before we get to a full on Q&A if, if people want to participate in that, uh, just to make sure that this message gets out from Swick Tech that um, on June 10th, we're going to be hosting a Microsoft Teams 201 um, tutorial webinar around meetings, chat and calls through Teams. This webinar is live through Microsoft Teams. It's something that we've been championing at Swick Tech. Um, Teams live events, webinars wasn't really a thing before all of this. And so we jumped on that pretty rapidly and it's changing and expanding every single day. They're, they're still trying to catch up to Zoom in some capacity, um, but we're seeing new features get lit up all the time. This background that I have is not you know, a real background. Obviously, they've changed that uh, right out of the gate that you can now have, um, I think it's up to nine people on a screen instead of the, the three or four that it was initially. Um, they're working on doing things like the uh, breakout sessions, which I know Zoom already does. So there's some limitations of Teams still in contrast to Zoom and vice versa for Zoom to Teams, but uh, it'll be a good one if anyone wants to learn more about that. And we'll be partnering with Excel and Flourish on that. They do a lot of trainings. Uh, Jennifer Buchholz is the, the CEO over there. So uh, with that, we can jump into any Q&A. We can linger here for a few minutes and, and see um, if questions come through in the in the Q and A section here, uh, Ryan will be letting those through as they as they come in. Do you have any questions for Todd? Now is the time to ask. Any other final thoughts, Todd? Will we wait for maybe a question or two to pop in? Yeah, I would just say there are two massive temptations right now for every business. The first one is um, to figure everything out on on your own, and, and um, that's a huge mistake. There are so many companies going through the same thing you are right now. There's an opportunity to save money, save time, go faster, uh, pivot faster if necessary by working in collaborative efforts. Um, the, uh, the trick to that is to um, find partners, curate the partners that you're doing business with. And we've got some tools around that if, if um, that's something that you're interested in doing to make sure that um, you don't waste a lot of time uh, building partnerships that don't go anywhere uh, or don't add value. The second piece that 
a lot of people are tempted to do right now is to firefight. And it's obviously critically important. Uh, you know, we wake up every day at 3 a.m. We don't know exactly what day it is, but we do know that we're going to go to work for the next 15 hours. And um, it's a huge struggle to uh, lift your head up and look to the future. And this is why uh, there's a need for work groups and planning teams. And the planning teams have to have some vision for what's coming next. They're the team that needs to be responsible for that. In a small company, it may be some of the same resources, but it's very difficult to make that transition because near term always feels like the immediate, uh, the priority. And it probably is, but you won't get out of that mode either from a talent standpoint or a business standpoint if you're simply um, fighting fires all day long. Thank you. The, uh, another question did come through, so thank you um, for posting this. The final two elements of the four truths uh, for the future of work, it sounds like you'd outlined the first two, uh, but maybe they had missed the, the, the final two or um, we didn't get there. Yeah, I threw that slide up pretty quickly. Um, so the first is continuous improvement and lifelong learning. The second is tapping into human potential. We know more about the brain today and how people work and what motivates them and what makes them productive than we did. We know 10 times more about the brain than we knew 10 years ago, um, just because of that's a, a exponential technology in neuroscience. The third piece is human to human collaboration. There's new science. I'm, I'm deeply involved in um, building operating systems that enable ecosystems to be operational and efficient and so forth. Uh, oftentimes, we don't put structure around partnerships and multi-stakeholder partnerships. Human-to-human uh, -human collaboration is something that is going to explode now. We've seen it during crisis, um, but there are ways to curate groups. Um, 26 companies in the new North region looking at data analytics together, finding um, uh, economies of scale in the learning portion. Like, why pay for workshops on your own? Why not economize? Why make mistakes in your procurement processes? Why not find the buying groups that are focused on PPE and other things? Leverage the strength of, of others. Future of work is also about collaboration. The last piece is human to machine convergence. Um, we, you will, by 2023, everybody on the call today will be leveraging intelligent technologies in some way to perform customer facing and back office functions, as well as um, on the shop floor for the manufacturing industry. Great. Human to machine convergence. Todd, how, how should people engage with you to learn more specifically on some of the things you had talked about? Um, what's the best way for the folks listening in or those that listen in later on to reach out? So I literally just turned on a YouTube channel that's got the three um, videos on it that I archived. I'm always on LinkedIn. That's a really great way to get to me. Pendio, P-E-N-D-I-O dot I-O. Um, ConvergeMKE.com, ConvergeMKE.com. We're putting the... Um, uh, the PPE buying group, the health equity movement, and the um, emotional resilience piece uh, up this weekend. So um, convergemke.com is another place to find me. And I've got live streams coming up uh, every week with global experts because, like Eric said, I, I don't have to have all the answers. If we know who the experts are in the world, let's go get that and share it with everybody. Fantastic. I don't see any other questions that have come through. We're right at uh, the time mark, uh, one minute under. So everybody, thanks so much for tuning in today. Hopefully uh, you got some value out of this. I think we'll be sharing it via email for everyone that had attended as a recorded uh, webinar. And um, I, I, that's all I have for everybody. Thank you very much for your time today.